Chris Evans' portrayal of Captain America is undoubtedly one of the brightest highlights in all of Marvel's Infinity Saga, but he's often the most underappreciated of the MCU's big three heroes. So why is that? Today, we'll be taking an in-depth look at the evolution of Captain America throughout the MCU, analyzing how he's portrayed in each individual film, and coming to grips with just how dramatically the legacy of Steve Rogers weighs on Marvel to this day. Ever since I first saw Ultimate Avengers in 2006, the story of Captain America had me completely enraptured. There's just something so compelling about a man out of time continuing the fight for freedom and sticking by his morals no matter what. As a result, seeing Nick Fury tell Tony Stark about the Avengers initiative absolutely blew my mind. Sure, it was cool that Kevin Feige was crafting an interwoven narrative that would become the most profitable property in entertainment, but I didn't care about that. What got me excited was that my favorite superhero would be getting his own movie. Released in 2011, the first Avenger was pretty much everything that I wanted. Marvel honestly deserves a lot of props for this movie. Even though I already adored him, Captain America was looked at by many as a one-dimensional, often cartoonish relic from a bygone era. And to be fair, that is how he started off. We've all seen that picture of Cap punching Mr. Mustache in the face. It's no secret that he originated as a piece of wartime propaganda. Rather than ignoring or erasing this part of the character's history though, Marvel instead chose to cleverly subvert this origin. See, the musical war bond sequence isn't just a silly way to move the plot forward. It's a brilliant setup for the conundrum at the heart of Steve's character, which is who does Captain America really fight for? The obvious answer is America, right? After all, it's in his name, but that's an oversimplification, especially if we consider the path the character goes down in phases two and three. In reality, Steve Rogers is not loyal to America, but rather American ideals. Liberty, freedom, equality, these are the concepts that Steve will always defend, even if it makes him an enemy of the United States. But that doesn't happen until later. Something worth noting is just how pivotal the first act of this movie is. The filmmakers truly endear us to Skinny Steve. So much so in fact that even after years of him looking like this, we still believe that he's that same scrawny guy who got beat up in an alley. See, the thematic question at the heart of this film is what makes a person special? Initially, Steve doesn't understand why he was chosen for the Super Soldier program. After all, I'm just a kid from Brooklyn. However, characters like Dr. Erskine and Peggy Carter make him realize that his bravery and selflessness make him a far greater hero than physical strength ever could. Steve's physical transformation into the iconic Captain America doesn't change who he is. The newfound strength merely allows him to fight for what he believes in more effectively. Speaking of fighting, the villains in this film are probably the weakest overall aspect. Hydra and Red Skull just feel generic, and in comparison to how fleshed out all the good guys are, it's a shame that the antagonists didn't get the treatment that villains in Phase 3 would get. Also, I'd be remiss not to talk specifically about Peggy. For obvious reasons, she's not in the MCU a lot after this film, but she's honestly one of the standout characters from the franchise. Hayley Atwell beautifully balances Agent Carter's hardened exterior with the kind, caring person that lies underneath. Her relationship with Steve is the most compelling in all of Marvel, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's clear their chemistry is about more than physical attraction. She and Steve both know that people are quick to judge you based on appearances and easily overlook the person underneath, but Peggy and Steve see each other for who they really are. Unfortunately, their romance would have to take a rain check. Though it might be tragic, Steve's decision to sacrifice himself comes as no surprise to Peggy. His selflessness is both why she loves him and why she loses him. But this wasn't the end for Captain America. After all, I can do this all day. Joss Whedon's Avengers is a particularly strong chapter for Captain America, because it functions in many ways as a direct sequel. 
The last film ended with the cliffhanger of Cap waking up in modern times, but Avengers is where we really see that play out. Whedon's quippy style of filmmaking isn't a perfect fit for every franchise, but here it works brilliantly. It plays up the whimsical aspects of Golden Age comic books while grounding the piece in how seriously it treats the characters. For Cap specifically, they get to play up the dissonance between who he actually is and the legacy he left behind. Coulson, for example, completely geeks out when he meets Steve, fondly remembering all the Captain America stories and merchandise he consumed as a kid. Meanwhile, Steve sees these stories as traumatic memories that, to him, feel only a few days old. It would be like if a soldier made it through Normandy, only to find out the next day that they're selling action figures of him back home. All things considered, Steve handles the nature of his situation pretty well. Whereas any normal person would be completely overwhelmed, Steve takes it all in stride, choosing to solely focus on the mission at hand, and that mission is to lead the Avengers. Cap's dynamic with the rest of the team is one of the best parts of this film. The nuances in how he treats different characters really delivers on the promise of an ensemble cast. Banner reminds him a lot of Erskine, and he treats the human Hulk with a great deal of respect. He simultaneously views Black Widow as a fellow soldier, yet refers to her with an old-timey man-to-woman politeness. Thor is sort of an enigma to him, but they're both essentially demigods amongst men, so they find common ground. Last, and most importantly, is Tony Stark. The reason this dynamic is so pivotal is because Captain America and Iron Man are essentially the two lead characters in the Infinity Saga. Of all the heroes that we meet, their parallel character arcs are the ones we follow most closely. Needless to say, if we weren't compelled by these two, the MCU could have very easily fallen apart. Luckily, their seemingly opposite personalities create a spark the moment they appear on screen together. If Steve is utterly selfless and by the book, Tony is an ego-driven maverick. The two were destined to butt heads, yet they also wind up bringing the best out of one another. By the end of this movie, each of them truly respects the other, and as their relationship ebbs and flows throughout the saga, the audience is utterly invested. Honestly, the only real critique I have of Captain America in this movie is the uniform. I love what it represents narratively, but the downgrade from his original suit is hard to exaggerate. Granted, Chris Evans could make an empty potato sack look stylish, so it doesn't take away from the movie all that much. For the first ensemble piece in the MCU, Cap was utilized brilliantly, and the narrative threads set up here would go on to really pay off for him in later phases. Moving on to the Winter Soldier, this is where my opinions might get a little bit controversial. Many hold this one in high regard, and I would agree that it's one of the best films in all of the MCU. Personally though, I don't really like it as a Captain America story. Don't get me wrong, bringing on the Russo brothers to direct was an inspired choice as they brought a new level of genre storytelling to the MCU. The Winter Soldier is a perfectly executed political spy thriller. It just doesn't quite deliver on the more personal beats I want to see from the Star Spangled Man. The film starts to really dig into what it would be like to be the man out of time. But the movie's brisk pace means that it doesn't explore these ideas as fully as I would like. Little details like his notebook are fascinating, but almost completely absent from Acts 2 and 3. His reunion with Peggy, his nervousness around Natasha, his new friendship with Sam are all delightful to watch. However, these elements can often get lost in all the conspiratorial drama throughout the film. Speaking of which, the Winter Soldier works excellently as the antagonist, but they wouldn't truly capture his full potential as a character until Civil War. Steve's struggle to differentiate between his friend Bucky and the brainwashed assassin makes for compelling drama, but it's not given quite enough time. The fact that Robert Redford is the real villain cleverly subverts expectations, but also means that Bucky couldn't be quite as fleshed out. Looking back, I recognize that this film truly shaped the MCU we know today. 
It was the first time they really let a director change up the style of a Marvel film. Kevin Feige wouldn't have taken risks on people like James Gunn, Taika Waititi, or Ryan Coogler if Winter Soldier wasn't such a success. And once again, I really do like this film. I just think it's more focused on the plot's conflict than developing its protagonist. That being said, we do set up some key shifts in Steve's character. Initially, Captain Rogers was more or less by the book, but what do you do when the system you're fighting for turns out to be corrupt? This is the main question Cap has to wrestle with in Winter Soldier. The Hydra shield conspiracy forces Captain America to go rogue. In doing so, he realizes that it's sometimes necessary to fight against those in power, even if you once believed them to be your ally. His loyalty is to freedom and individual liberty. At his core, nothing, not even safety, is worth sacrificing those values. This really cemented that Captain America could exist as a superhero not just for Americans, but for everybody. So even if I don't love how he's utilized in this installment, it's also responsible for him being able to thrive in future projects. Next, we have Age of Ultron, which, despite being pretty messy, I actually really enjoy. At the time, it was a bit underwhelming, and kind of felt like just another adventure for the Avengers. But now that's exactly why I like it so much. We really get to see Cap and the rest of the team in their element. This isn't an origin story, and it's also not about their team falling apart. This is a movie where the Avengers are an established team with routines and familiar dynamics. I don't know, maybe what I really like about Age of Ultron is the first 30 minutes? Seeing the team act as a coordinated strike force against Hydra and then throw a huge party afterwards is exactly what I want out of a Marvel movie. Steve has clearly come into his own and is starting to really adjust to modern times. He's drinking buddies with Thor and a wingman for Bruce. He's the shot caller for the team, and despite a bit of tension with Iron Man, the two manage to get along quite well. Things aren't quite as strong once Ultron comes into play, but Steve is still utilized effectively. We further explore his contentious relationship with Tony and how different they really are. See, while Tony might like to think that he's in charge of the Avengers, Steve shows us that being a leader isn't about attention. Captain America is the heart of the Avengers. As their moral compass, he's able to take charge without demanding it. He leads by example rather than trying to control others. The only time his leadership becomes aggressive is when Tony's arrogance puts the rest of the team in harm's way. At times, Age of Ultron can definitely be accused of putting the cart before the horse. More than any other MCU project, it feels mainly like set up for future entries, rather than its own standalone product. That's not inherently a bad thing, but as the DCEU has shown us, you have to take your time. Marvel fans were already all in on this universe. You didn't have to sell them on what was coming next because they were more than happy to watch each and every film as they came out. Additionally, this was the last project Joss Whedon worked on before the reins were handed over to the Russo brothers. As a result, a lot of the setup teased in Ultron never actually came to fruition. Overall, this entry didn't shake up Cap's character dramatically, but it did prove that there is no Avengers without Steve Rogers. He represents what the team stands for, and without him, you might just have a civil war on your hands. Awkward segues aside, Civil War is a weird movie to analyze because it's technically Captain America 3, but functions much more like Avengers 2.5. That's not a bad thing, but it just changes how I view it. With that being said, I really enjoy this one. It features a large ensemble cast, but manages to still deliver intimate, meaningful moments for individual characters. As an audience member, we really get to see why Steve can't bring himself to sign the Sokovia Accords. It's a big decision for him to go rogue, but it's not out of character. 
Once again, we see that Captain America is loyal to the concepts of liberty and freedom, not the institutions that claim to uphold them. Simultaneously, the audience also sees the flaws in his line of thinking, which is why we can also sympathize with Team Iron Man. Their disagreement is the core of this film, and if we didn't see validity in both sides, the movie would not work. Thankfully, both Steve and Tony have fleshed out scenes that explore their reasons for doing what they do, which only makes it hurt that much more to watch their friendship get torn apart. The film ultimately positions Team Captain America as being the righteous ones, but it's a nuanced enough issue that you could see it going either way. I think what specifically tips the scales in Cap's favor is the fact that he's protecting his friend. We've seen time and time again that Steve Rogers is as selfless as he is brave. We can't help but understand why he would sacrifice his reputation and the camaraderie of the Avengers in order to protect his best friend. Most importantly, the film does not make the choice feel easy. You see just how much this conundrum shakes Steve to his very core. The foundation of his beliefs and ideology are completely rocked by this impossible decision he has to make. More than any other film, Civil War showcases why Chris Evans was the perfect person to portray this iconic superhero. Like Superman, it's easy for the casual viewer to write off Captain America as an idealistic boy scout without a lot of depth. But Chris Evans delivers a layered performance that beautifully captures the struggle between what is right and what is easy. Aside from the small bit of hope that the end monologue gives us, the third Captain America film plays out a lot like a tragedy. There's a looming sense of inevitability and impermanence that seeps into every scene. When things are going well, you know they won't last, and when things are going poorly, you know that it can still get a whole lot worse. This dark new tone subtly paved the way for the upcoming Infinity War and Endgame, and really solidified that the MCU could tell an emotionally impactful story. To end on a brighter note, the few lines of dialogue exchanged between Peter and Steve never fail to amuse me. I'm honestly kind of mad that these two didn't get more time to interact. Sure, Iron Man is the designated mentor figure for Spider-Man, but it would have been awesome if Peter actually connected with more of the original Avengers. Speaking of missed connections, that is the number one issue with Avengers Infinity War. For as epic in scope as that movie is, we never really get to see a fully unified team. The Avengers are split up into two groups, the ones on Earth and the ones in space. As a result, Tony, Steve, and each of their respective teams never truly interact. Overall, it's for the benefit of the story, but it sadly means that we miss out on a lot of potential character interaction. Sure, the Avengers all technically assemble in Endgame, but only for the finale. We never get to see Captain America have a conversation with, say, Star-Lord or Doctor Strange. Instead, Cap starts off the movie leading the rest of the rogue Avengers. The hype when they arrive to save Vision is unreal, but it also bums me out we never got to see what they were up to in between the film and Civil War. Spider-Man's gym teacher vaguely references Steve being a war criminal, but it would have been really exciting to see Cap make a cameo as Nomad in something like Black Panther or the second Ant-Man. The complex nature of Infinity War's story, and the fact that Thanos is structurally the protagonist, means that Steve Rogers doesn't get all that much screen time to himself. But the scenes he does have are immaculate. The mutual respect he and T'Challa share, and seeing them lead their troops into battle, perfectly encapsulates what makes this shared universe so special. I especially love how unwilling he is to sacrifice Vision. Especially after Civil War, he doesn't want to do anything that would damage the team and those he cares about. Sure, Steve is all too willing to sacrifice his own life, 
but forcing a friend to do the same is unthinkable. This further contributes to the nuance that makes Captain America so much more than just a Boy Scout. He has a rigidly complex moral code, but it's not static. It evolves as he does and adapts to each and every dilemma he faces. Also, the filmmakers deserve a lot of respect for not reuniting Cap and Iron Man in this movie. First of all, it adds weight to the end of Civil War, knowing that they don't immediately reconcile. Additionally, it allows the audience to see the respect each of them has for one another, despite their disagreement. Steve would never give Tony the satisfaction of saying it to his face, but when he learns that Iron Man is off-world, he openly remarks that Earth just lost her best defender. It's a subtle moment, but speaks volumes about the two men's relationship. Even though I would have liked a little more focus on Cap throughout this film, the movie includes so many characters and so much plot that I really can't complain. It's one of the best action blockbusters ever made, and the culmination of a decade's worth of storytelling. Endgame was not only Captain America's final appearance, but also a finale to the Infinity Saga, an unprecedented story spanning over 20 films and 10 years. There was a lot of pressure on this movie, and it easily could have buckled under the weight of expectations. However, the Russo brothers made the genius decision to scale back this film compared to its predecessor, and tell an intimate story about grief and redemption. For the first two acts, Endgame is much smaller in scope than Infinity War. The main ensemble consists of far fewer characters, mainly the original Avengers, meaning that the film can spend much more time on each one of them. We get to see how the team, along with the entire world, does their best to cope with half the population disappearing. The snap was especially hard on Steve Rogers, because he views it as a personal failure. Like I mentioned previously, he has no hesitation when it comes to putting his own life on the line, but losing his friends is almost too much for him to bear. Both he and Natasha throw themselves into their work in order to avoid dealing with their grief directly. I think a lot of his shame is triggered by Tony's critique of him before the five year time jump. Tony points out that if the Avengers were a unified team when Thanos attacked, they most likely could have stopped him. Even if Steve was in the right during Civil War, his actions indirectly led to the snap, and being the person he is, Cap of course fully blames himself. That's why as soon as there's an ounce of hope, Steve does not hesitate in assembling the Avengers. To him, reversing the snap is about more than saving lives, it's about his own redemption. And maybe, even more important than that, it's an opportunity for reconciliation with his longtime friend. Getting Tony to join them on their mission through time is vital, because Steve needs to prove that they can still be a team. They can't always communicate their feelings, but in working together, their actions speak far louder than words ever could. Looking specifically at the third act, there are three elements that really stand out to me. The first should come as no surprise. When Cap catches Mjolnir, Jonathan? it was a moment everyone wanted, but no one was sure if we'd ever get. Beyond the sheer awesomeness of the beat, it also reflects beautifully on the character of Captain America. We always knew that Steve Rogers was a special human being, but to have a magical hammer deem him worthy felt just poetic enough without being on the nose. The fact that Thor was so happy for him doesn't hurt either. The second moment is just prior to the portal sequence. With Iron Man and Thor seemingly out of commission, and the rest of his team stuck under thousands of pounds of rubble, Steve stands alone, looking out at the horde of enemies. No one would judge him if he gave up in this moment. It's one against many. The odds are insurmountable. But does he give up? Does he run away? Does he even flinch? No. He straps on what remains of his shield, he turns to face the enemy, and he holds fast. Because guess what? I can do this all day. 
Captain America is willing to take on Thanos and his army all by himself because he is the true embodiment of a hero. He puts the cause above all else. Obviously, the rest of the Avengers show up just in the nick of time, but this moment tells us all anyone ever needs to know about Steve Rogers. The third and final element that I adore from the finale is the fact that he isn't the one to make the sacrifice play. It's Iron Man who sacrifices his life for the greater good. I have no doubt that Cap gladly would have done the same if he was wearing the Infinity Gauntlet, but it means so much more that he doesn't. Instead, we see the payoff to all his bravery. By never once wavering in his beliefs, Steve Roger inspired his friends to do the same. Cap's dedication to what he stands for inspired Tony Stark, the man who once loved no one more than himself, to make the ultimate sacrifice. As I mentioned earlier, Captain America leads by example. His own selflessness inspired those around him and indirectly saved the world. The skinny kid from Brooklyn who doesn't like bullies became the world's greatest hero, and he didn't have to die in order to do it. To make one last point about Endgame, I absolutely adore that the final shot is just Steve and Peggy dancing. Not only is it the perfect ending to Cap's multi-film arc, but it also shows just how human the story of the MCU is. It doesn't end on a big battle or all the Avengers lined up for the perfect snapshot. It ends with Steve Rogers finally getting to dance with the girl of his dreams. Like Captain America himself, the MCU is wrapped up in an extraordinary, super-powered package, but it's the human element underneath that makes it special. This is why a post-Captain America MCU feels so weird, and why it's no surprise that Falcon and the Winter Soldier directly deals with what a complicated legacy has been left behind. Chris Evans as Captain America isn't as flashy as Robert Downey Jr's Iron Man, or as funny as Chris Hemsworth's Thor. The brilliance of his role and performance is much more subtle, and therefore harder to replicate. I think if Marvel truly wants to recapture the magic of Steve Rogers, they need to not focus on superficial things like his shield or suit. Instead, focus on what he stood for. He's simultaneously relatable and an example of who we can aspire to become. That's honestly something you can apply to almost any superhero, so hopefully Marvel can find a new way to sprinkle in that X factor for years to come. If you're still here after all that, click here for more Marvel retrospectives or here to subscribe for more videos. I'm Dylan, and this has been The Writer's Block.